Well, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, picking up in verse 11 through verse 22. We looked at the first part of Ephesians a couple weeks ago, and we'll finish up chapter 2 this morning, Lord willing. Title of our study, A Holy Temple. A Holy Temple. Well, I was thinking about how to introduce uh, this section of uh, chapter 2. It made me really stop and think about our world that we live in today. There's a lot of crime and hatred in the world, and I find it's usually towards people who have different backgrounds than you. Uh, Maybe you guys have heard or seen of the Black Lives Matter movement, or you've heard about the five policemen that were killed in Dallas, Texas. And yet we see this in our local paper all the time as well, uh, that there's crime and there's hatred and there's violence. And it's sad. It's sad to see such hatred between people. And, um, and yet there is hope. The hope is Jesus. And when you come to Jesus Christ, He takes that heart of hatred and He gives you that heart of love for everyone. Even those you may not really like, you still love them. And, uh, and, and so that's the heart that, that we have now in Christ is a heart of love. And that's our heart, heart's prayer for others is that they would come to Jesus and be changed and transformed as well. But as Paul writes to us uh, in, in this, this letter, well, to the Ephesians, but it's for us as well, we see that even in the early church there were such problems. And it was pri- made up primarily of issues between Jews and Gentiles. Now, the Jews uh, were, you could say, maybe based more in Jerusalem, which would make sense, right, in Israel. And so the early church was made up of a lot of Jews who came to Christ, right? They were what we'd call completed Jews or Messianic Jews uh, in, our, in a sense today. Um, and so the gospel was going forth to all the you know, cities and towns and villages around to the Gentiles. That's anyone who was non-Jewish. And, uh, and they were getting saved. But there were some contentions between those two groups. And, uh, and Paul addresses that. And, uh, and he tells them that in Christ they can have unity and peace and love. And, um, and that's what our world needs today. How is that possible? Well, let's read and find out together. Uh, we'll pick up here in verse 11 and go through uh, verse 13. Uh, verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2 says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, then he describes it a little bit, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Anytime we, uh, as Bible students, read uh, in our Bible the word therefore, we should pause and stop and ask the question, what, what is the therefore therefore? Well, in light of what we looked at a couple weeks ago, that we are saved by grace, through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we also looked that God has created us as His workmanship, uh, His masterpiece, you could say. And He's prepared good works for us in advance, that we should walk in those good works. In light of this, Paul is telling us that we need to remember who we used to be. We need to remember the past. And uh, we need to remember who we were without Christ so we can, we can remember that we've both come to Christ the same way, through the grace of God by our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So he says we need to remember. He says that we need to remember we were without Christ. We had no Savior. And the truth is these are terrible words. If we had no Savior to rescue us, if we had no one to come and, and take away our sins, it's really the, the sum of the woeful condition of the lost man or woman. And the Ephesians, 
they were without Christ. Uh, at that time, they worshipped the false goddess Diana. And uh, before the coming of the gospel, they knew nothing about Christ. And so Paul's reminding them, <laughs> you, you didn't have a Savior before, but now you do. But he also says that they were an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. And, and what that phrase means is essentially without citizenship. You know, God called the Jews and, and built them into a nation. He gave them His laws and His blessings. Now, a Gentile could enter as a proselyte, one who was converted, um, but they were still not born into that special nation. Israel was God's nation, and, and in a way that wasn't true of any Gentile nation. But it also says that they were a stranger from the covenants of promise. Now, we remember in Genesis chapter 12 that God made a covenant with Abraham. He, he said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And they also said, in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And that includes the Gentiles. So there is a promise there that through Israel, when the Messiah came, all the nations would be blessed. <coughs> but what's interesting is that God never made a covenant with the Gentile nation. The Gentiles were aliens or strangers. And uh, it's interesting because the Jews never let them forget that. <laughs> the Jews always said, oh, you're Gentiles. You're not like us. And uh, this issue was coming to the church when people got saved. Well, I have a Jewish background. You have a Gentile background. Uh, somehow I'm closer to God than you. And, um, and uh, it's interesting, many of the Pharisees at that time... Um, they would pray daily, O oh God, I give thanks that I am a Jew and not a Gentile. <laughs> One commentary I read said that the Jewish mindset was that they hated Gentiles so much that they figured God just created Gentiles for firewood and kindling in hell. I mean, there was this, such a hatred between these two groups. And yet in Christ, they could have love for one another. But well, Paul also says that they were without hope. What's interesting is historians tell us at this time there's a great deal of hopelessness in, the, in all the ancient world. Uh, philosophies were empty, traditions were disappearing, religions were powerless to help men face either life or death. And people longed to pierce the veil and get some message of hope from the other side. But there was none. And they were also without God in the world. Now, you remember when Paul was in Athens in Acts chapter 17, he found many false gods and many false idols. It's interesting because some uh, of that day said that it was easier to find a god or an idol in Athens than it was a man. They were everywhere, false idols. And so they were without God. But they were also without God in the world. And that's important because some people believe in God, but he believes, they believe he lives in heaven and has nothing to do with this world. And that way a person can still believe in God and be without God in the world. And we know that Jesus Christ came from heaven to this world to rescue us. And so we have been rescued through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so God has reconciled us to himself and, uh, and it has to start there. Before we can um, be reconciled with other people, we have to be first reconciled with God. And it, it, it starts there. And so we have this reconciliation with the Lord through the Son. And I love what Paul does here in verse 13. I would encourage you to underline those words, but now. <laughs> if we just stopped at verse 12, we would feel so hopeless, right? But verse 13, we, we have that hope. right? We find our, our salvation. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Jesus. From the very beginning, blood was required to atone for sins. You remember in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell from grace and sinned against God. Right, they were trying first hide from God, and then cover themselves up from God, uh, from their sin, and and it didn't work out very well for them. Uh, but it does say that God killed an animal and clothed them in skins. 
They were, they were clothed in skins. Now, what was the animal that had to be sacrificed for those skins to be taken and, and for them to be given to Adam and Eve? We're not told. I'd like to think it was a lamb, but I, I can't be for certain. But we know from that very beginning there was a sacrifice. And we see that their kids, um, Cain and Abel, knew that a sacrifice was required to bring to the Lord. So from the very beginning, from the first time that mankind sinned, there was a blood sacrifice that was to be brought. It was required. And so since then, uh, that sacrifice was needed. And we also see that um, in the tabernacle and the temple, both of them had a priest who would sacrifice an animal on behalf of the people for their atonement. And yet I love this, that Jesus became, well, he was always uh, our high priest, but he became a sacrifice for us. You know, the high priest became the sacrifice for the people. And uh, I love this, that God has brought us near through his blood, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, many people think you can draw near to God, and they have their own ideas of how to do that. Some think you can do that by keeping the law, trying to keep the Ten Commandments, or by trying to be a good person. Um, other people think that if you belong to a certain group, such as you're born in Israel, or you're you know, connected to the church, uh, that, that somehow you'll draw near to God. But the only way you can brought near to God is by the blood of Christ. By what Jesus did on the cross for us, right? By shedding His blood on that cross. That's the only way we have access to heaven, to the fathers, through the blood. And so, Jesus became that blood sacrifice for us guilty sinners. He took our place. And through that, it says He brings us near to God. He, he's brought us... Behind that veil, he's brought us to the very presence of God the Father. And uh, it's through the blood of Christ, through his sacrifice for us, uh, that we have this reconciliation. And so I love this, that it's in Christ Jesus. And Paul will remind us of this truth a few times, of what Christ has done for us. Well, next, Paul's going to talk a bit about this, this uh, wall of separation that had existed at that time and how it was removed in Christ. And we'll read that here in verses 14 through 18 together. He says, For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he himself might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that was the Gentiles, and to those who were near, that was the Jews, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. I love what Paul says here in verse 14. For he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Now it is true when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus that we then have peace with God. Right? We are no longer enemies of God. We have peace with God through the Son, Jesus Christ. And it's also true that we have peace with other people. Right? We can start to to love people as Christ gives us his love for others. But I love what Paul says here. Because Jesus not only gives us peace, it says he is our peace. I love this because this is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. It was prophesied that a child was going to be born. And we often quote this verse during Christmas time, right? For unto you a child is born. He shall be called. And we have all these magnificent titles. And one of those is the Prince of Peace. And Jesus fulfilled that. He is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. There's a direct fulfillment of prophecy. And Jesus Christ, that He bridged that gap between us and the Father and he also made peace between Jew and Gentile, between 
people of all kind. And so the work of Jesus on the cross is the common salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. There's therefore no longer any dividing wall between the two. Jesus broke down this wall. And I want to show you a picture of this um, so you can kind of get a glance at this of what was going on at that time. I think it's, it's helpful to know. Uh, in the temple, between the court of the Gentiles and the court of women, there's this physical barrier. You can see it there on the screen. And it was an actual wall of separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, you remember when Paul is writing this letter, he's under house arrest. Right? Remember the book of Acts that uh, Paul was preaching the gospel and somebody falsely accused him, Hey, you brought a Gentile into the temple. And I, you know, we, we just assume we saw this Gentile and Paul must have brought him in and there was this big riot in the Antonia Fortress and he was brought up the stairs and made his plea and, and then they were going to flog him. And he said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. And then they found out they were going to try and kill Paul and there was a, you know, this big plot to kill him and they were fasting. And so they said, all right, well, let's send him away. Well, all this was because <laughs> the Jews and the Gentiles are supposed to be separate. And so there was this, this barrier, this wall of separation. And um, I love that Paul makes it clear that in Jesus, the wall is gone. And so this wall of separation is gone because of our common unity in Jesus is greater than any previous division. And uh, we need to remember that. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this, this picture of, of how the temple is laid out is that the court of the Gentiles is what? Large. It's very large. God's desire from the beginning when, he, when the temple was created was that mass amounts of Gentiles would come and worship Him. And yet you recall that twice in the, in the ministry of Jesus on earth, He had to cleanse out the temple. They, that's where they were selling all kinds of stuff. Sheep, and they were, you know, Jesus said, you're, you're to make my house a house of prayer. And you've turned into a, a den of robbers and thieves. They, they were taking up all the space for the Gentiles to come and worship the Lord. So Jesus was upset about that because he wanted everyone to come and worship. And, uh, and so it's a reminder to us that we don't want to put up a barrier to keep someone from coming to the Lord, to come and worship him. And uh, we have this lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. And, and that should help us. See, there's, there's nothing that... Um, is a great difference between us and others. Some people, they get so caught up in the po politics or racial things or economics or language or geography or whatever. Um, and, and, I, and it's sad because they don't really understand the lordship of Jesus Christ. That in Him, there's, there's no division. We have that unity. This wall of separation is gone. And it's through the cross that we have this unity. That this middle wall of separation is gone. We've been reconciled. And uh, we are now reconciled to God through the cross. What's also interesting here is that it says that, that uh, we are one in Christ. right? That we are one new man in Christ Jesus. I found this fascinating because in the early church, the Christians, they call themselves a th the, the third race or a new race because the Christians recognized that they weren't Jews or Gentiles, but that they were Christians. They were in Christ Jesus. And sometimes when I'll chat with people in our community and you know ask them some spiritual questions, I often get them saying you know that they are this denomination or that denomination, such as, you know, I'm a Lutheran or I'm Catholic or, you know, I'm Protestant. And I think that's, that's great. Um, but you know what? We want to first identify with Christ as I'm a Christian. <laughs> if that's not your primary identification, there's something wrong. Because when you get to heaven, it's not going to be, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm a this or that. It's going to be, I'm saved by the blood of Christ. I'm his follower. I'm a, I'm a Christian. And the early church got that. They understood who they were in Christ. And they, they were embracing that they were a new creation in Jesus Christ. And again, Paul will remind us again and again, it's through the cross. He places this emphasis on, the, on Jesus on the cross. We see we're made near 
to God by the blood, that uh, it's through the blood of Jesus on the cross. It says that having abolished in his flesh the enmity, so Jesus on the cross through his flesh has destroyed uh, you know, the, this separation from us, from the Father, and also in one body through the cross. One body, this, this church, this unity, uh, it's through Jesus Christ. And this unity didn't just happen. This was a hard-fought accomplishment of Jesus. You remember in, in uh, John chapter 17, Jesus prayed that they may be one, Father, as we are one. God's desire is that we would have unity. And, um, and it wasn't just a prayer. It was a prayer Jesus prayed knowing he was going to go to the cross and do that work to atone for our sins, to take our place. And he knew he would accomplish. And he knew he was willing to pay the price so we could have that unity. And, you know, I'm grateful for that community worship service that we get to do every year. And I think that's a constant reminder that we're united in Jesus Christ. You know, we may not uh, be best friends with individuals in other churches. There may be some we get along better with. But we're going to probably see a lot of these people in heaven. We should learn how to get along and love each other. And, uh, and it's through Jesus Christ, through the cross, that we have this unity together. So it's only in Jesus Christ that we have this unity. And... Uh, you know, the gospel came to those who were far, the Gentiles, and those who were near the Jews. Both needed the gospel. Both of them needed Jesus Christ. They needed to be saved. They needed to be rescued. And um, that's true. We, we need Jesus Christ. Everyone needs the Lord. People need the Lord. But Paul also says here um, that it's through Him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Both Jew and Gentile have now the same access to God, and that access comes by one Spirit to the Father. Not only are Jews and Gentiles saved by the same gospel, but they have the essential same walk with God and the same access to Him. One group doesn't have closer access than the other. And uh, this was something actually that uh, Martin Luther the Reformer fought for. Uh, we, we often know him that he... He wanted to you know, bring about that the Word of God is above any tradition of man. And we also know that he believed that you know, there were no, nothing that extra required to save you. It was your faith in Christ alone. It wasn't you know, baptism or indulgences or any other religious works. It was faith in Christ. But most people don't know this third one. The other thing that he was really fighting for was this, this wall of separation be removed between priest and laity. He believed at that time that the common person should have access to the scriptures. That they, they had the exact same access to God as those in church leadership. However, at that time, those in church leadership made it quite apparent to other people that somehow they were more closer to God than the common people. And Martin Luther didn't like that. <laughs> he knew from reading the word of God, we both have the exact same access to the God that, that died for us and loves us. And I think sometimes Christians get this mindset that somehow Mother Teresa or Billy Graham are somehow closer to God than me. You know, that, that Lord, they're somehow better friends with you than, than I'll ever be with you. And that's not true. We have the same access to the Lord. Right? We're saved by the same gospel. We have the same spirit living within us. And... Uh, I find this interesting that when conflict arises among Christians, you can pretty much be sure it's because they forget that they were saved by the same gospel, and that they both have the same access to God the Father. One or sometimes both of the groups usually feel that they have superior access to God. Sometimes it's put in the way, well, I've been a Christian longer than you. <laughs> or, you know, I know more about the Bible than you. Or, you know, it, it's... It's almost in a prideful sense that somehow because you know something more, you've been walking with the Lord longer, that somehow you've got closer access to God. Well, that's not true. <laughs> we have equal access to the Lord. Jesus Christ has broken down all these walls of separation. And we need to remember that. 
um, that we have our unity in Christ Jesus. Well, next Paul will uh, tell us that we are a living temple that is built on Christ our cornerstone. And we'll see that here in verses 19 through 22. He says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, here in verse 19, Paul says, Now therefore, in light of this wall of separation being removed, and that we remember who we used to be and who we are now in Christ, we're we're no longer strangers and, and foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, I don't know if this is where that band, the uh, Citizens and Saints, got their title from. It could be. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is awesome. We are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So we are citizens now. And, uh, you know, no longer strangers and foreigners. Paul says that we Gentiles should not be regarded as second-class citizens in God's kingdom. And uh, being a citizen means we have rights and responsibilities. We have the right to the throne of grace. We have the right to worship Jesus. We have the right to come to God and say, forgive us our sins. And he's faithful and just to do that. We have these rights. But we also have these responsibilities to tell other people about Jesus. To help them grow closer to Jesus. So as citizens now in the kingdom of God, we have the rights, but we also have some responsibilities. But he also says that we are members of the household of God. That's that's more than just citizenship. That means we're in the household of God. It's like more than just being a citizen of the United States of America. It's like you're living in the White House. I mean, that's what the, the picture is here. God has brought us into his household. We are in his family. And his forever family. And uh, we are members of his household. And I like this because sometimes Christians uh, get so wrapped up in church membership. And and people look to that sometimes for salvation or assurance of salvation. Well, I'm a member of this church. Or I'm a member of that church. And I remember when we first got here, you know, about three years ago, running into this gal and, and just chatting with her and trying to strike up a conversation. And... And asking her some spiritual questions. And she said she went to church. Or actually she didn't say that. She said she was a member of a church. And so uh, I didn't know what that meant at the time. So I asked, well, what was the last thing your pastor said that just really encouraged your heart? And she says, well, it's been a while. You know, I was baptized as an infant. And I kind of grew up a little bit in the church. And I'm a member of the church. But I haven't been back to church in 20 years. I thought, hmm, Okay. So you're a member of the church, but you're not actively participating as part of the church. Okay, there's something wrong here. And I love what Paul does here. He tells us the real membership we should be concerned about is where? In the household of God. That's where we want to be. That's our real membership, is we're members with the Lord. right? That our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. right? That's the, that's the registry we want to have our names written in, is the Lamb's Book of Life. So that's our, our concern. Is that's the membership we want to have, right? There's nothing wrong with having earthly memberships, but you want to make sure that you've got, first and foremost, your membership in heaven. And that's the one you're looking to, not an earthly one for assurance of salvation. So we need to have that membership. And, and I'm grateful that in Christ Jesus, we are members. We are part of his family. But he tells us that he is making this, this household, he's making this temple, this This holy temple. And it says here that it's being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now some people uh, don't like this, (laughs) that it says that the foundation is, you know, is the apostles and the prophets. 
with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. What it's saying here is that, in a sense, the apostles and prophets helped lay a foundation, right? They were supremely the authoritative uh, voice at the time. They were a revelation for all God's people. Uh, we have the New Testament because of these men of God. And so uh, they were, in a sense, a foundation to the early church. Now, as a foundation, I believe that means there are no uh, capital A apostles or capital P prophets today. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that foundation is already set. And we kind of get that here in the scripture, right? That's what we see. Uh, God's word is saying that they were that foundation. I do think in a sense, we maybe we have, I'd say, lowercase apostles or lowercase prophets today. Um, you know, and some people will take those titles upon themselves. But I don't believe we have those offices or titles in the same sense that Paul had in his day. Because the foundation has been laid in the early church. But it also says here that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, some people don't like that because they think, well, Jesus should be the foundation. Yes, he is the foundation. But what Paul is doing here is he's grabbing a hold of a picture that they would have understood at that time that maybe we don't understand in our day and age. That chief cornerstone in the East was considered to be even more important than the foundation. Why? Well, the cornerstone was placed in an extreme corner, and it binded all the other stones in the building together. It was the most important stone in the structure because it was the one in which every other stone was aligned with, and it was the one which everything else depended upon for stability. So if you didn't have that cornerstone, the building would be a mess. And oftentimes the, the person constructing would, would put their name, the royal name on that chief cornerstone. Well, Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone. The foundation of the church is built upon Him, and it's organized and structured around Him. If we didn't have Jesus Christ as our cornerstone, we would be a mess. Think of it like this. If you've ever seen a, uh, an older bridge, or you know, you'll see one of these arches sometimes, if you, especially if you go over to uh, the Middle East, you'll see these arches still used today. There's a stone right there on the top. It's called the keystone. If we removed that keystone, the arch would crumble and fall. Now you need all those stones working together, but there's one stone that brings the stability of all the other stones. And that was the same that was true with this chief cornerstone. That if you didn't have this cornerstone, you, you didn't have a way to really structure the rest of the building. And so Paul is grabbing a hold of this picture for us and saying, Our lives need to be built upon Christ. He needs to be the chief cornerstone in our life. And, uh, and he says that we are this, this holy temple being assembled. And Jesus Christ is the chief architect, right? It's his church, right? So he's, he's building this. He's growing it. It's fitting together. He's putting us in, in pieces where he wants them to go. In his holy temple in the Lord. But also says, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So we're being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, when Solomon built his temple, he built it out of these huge stones. And he had these stones prepared at a place that was far away from the temple building. And it was said at that time, you couldn't hear the sound of a hammer or an axe or any other iron tools at the site. And you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 6. And I love this because God does the same with us. right? He, he prepares us before He fits us into this holy temple. right? He saves us, and once He saves us, as we were far off, He brings us near. And He, he puts us into the family of God. He puts us into this building. He's, he's fitting us together. And he's, he's made us a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, individually, but then also corporately as His church. So it's a reminder that we used to be separated from God, but now we are holy and set apart to God to allow the Spirit to come and live in us and change us and transform us. And so 
We are this living temple that's built on Christ, our cornerstone. Now, remember the disciples, when they saw the temple in Jesus' time, um, they thought it was amazing. Some of them thought that when they saw Solomon's temple, which really, you could say, was David's temple. Solomon used all the materials and constructed it, but David had the blueprints and got all the material together. Um, and some people loved that temple. And you'll read later on when Nehemiah and Ezra, that they're trying to rebuild the walls and the temple, that some people were excited to see the foundation laid, and others were sad because they thought, it's not like it used to be. And then there was King Herod's temple, and that's the one the disciples were saying, man, look at this massive building. It's, it's just amazing. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left upon another. And we know that happened in 70 AD when the Roman... Uh, Emperor Governor Titus came in and and uh, destroyed everything. And if you go over um, to Rome today, they have this arc it's called the Ark of Titus, and you can see on the relief there uh, them carrying away the all the material from the Jews. You can see a menorah and all these different symbols that they they ransacked the temple and took them and they used them. And so that temple was destroyed. And there are many people today, if you go to Israel, they're looking for the, the third temple. They're looking for another temple to be built. And uh, when we go to Israel, and we're hoping to go again in a few years, we remind people that there is another temple. <laughs> a living temple that God is constructing. And it's of His people. He is assembling us together as a, this one large church family. And He's putting us together piece by piece. Because he desires to dwell in his people and among his people. And so we have this common foundation, right? The whole building of God's people growing together in a beautiful way as a holy temple where God dwells in beauty and glory. So we want to remember that, right? We're brought near to God by the blood of Christ. That there's no wall that separates us because that was removed in Christ Jesus and that now we are this living temple being built on Christ, our cornerstone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in these first few chapters, as we dig into the book of Ephesians, you want us just to sit and listen. You want to remind us of who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation. We thank you, Jesus, that you have rescued us that you have made a way for us to be saved, that we are now brought near through the blood of Jesus on the cross. That he was, took our place, that he was dead and buried, but rose from the grave. Lord, we thank you that you've removed that wall of separation from us not being able to come to you, that now we have direct access we can boldly approach the throne of grace and find our help in time of need. Lord, that you've broken down the walls that men like to build, to divide, to keep others away, to kind of have this holy huddle. Lord, may we not do that with people. May we build bridges to people so they can come to you. May we help people fall in love with you, Lord. And Lord, as, as we get to be a part of your church, may you continue, Lord, building us and putting us in that place, Lord, in your holy temple where you desire us to be. Help us, Lord, to be useful unto you. Lord, we love you. And we do pray, Lord, if there be any here among us this morning who have yet to surrender their life to you, that, Lord, you'd be working on their hearts right now. So, Lord, we ask that you would make yourself real to those who need you. That by your Spirit, you'd be convicting them of your sin and convincing them of your love for them. And that you took their place on the cross. And as every head is bowed here and every Christian is praying, if you're here this morning and you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ, you, you haven't done that yet, um, I want to encourage you to do that this morning. Um, God knows your heart and... And uh, I want to make sure that I never not give an invitation for people to get right with the Lord. And so you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I need to surrender to Him. I want to encourage you to raise your hand. And I'm simply going to lead you in a prayer 
where you say yes to Jesus. You say, Lord, forgive me my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new creature. Make me a new creation. If that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you to raise your hand and hold it high. Lord, we thank you for knowing us and loving us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, the source of our encouragement, of our equipping, the source of the promises you have for us. Lord, the word that gives us life. For Jesus, you are the living word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld your glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord Jesus, may we be your people, full of grace and truth. May we be people that are filled with faith, hope, and love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we'll have the distribution of communion. Hold the bread and the...